Welcome to the 65th A.W. Mellon Lectures in the Fine Arts. In this six-part lecture series entitled The Thief Who Stole My Heart, The Material Life of Chola Bronzes from South India, circa 855 to 1280, art historian Vidya Deheja discusses the work of artists of Chola, India, who created exceptional bronzes of the god Shiva, invoked as Thief Who Stole My Heart. Graceful, luminous sculptures of high copper content portrayed the deities as sensuous figures of sacred import. Every bronze is a portable image carried through temple and town to participate in celebrations that combine the sacred with the joyous atmosphere of carnival. In these lectures, Deheja discusses the images as tangible objects that interact in a concrete way with human activities and socio-economic practices. She asked questions of this body of material that have never been asked before, concerning the source of wealth that enabled the creation of bronzes, the origin of copper not available locally, the role of women patrons, the strategic position of the Chola Empire at the center of a flourishing ocean trade route between Aden and China, and the manner in which the Cholas covered the walls of their temples with thousands of inscriptions, converting them into public record offices. These sensuous portrayals of the divine gained their full meaning with critical study of information captured through a variety of lenses. In this second lecture, entitled Shiva as Victor of Three Forts, Battling for Empire 855 to 955, originally delivered at the National Gallery of Art on April 10th, 2016, Professor de Hager considers the first bronzes created in the mid-9th century at a time when the early Chola kings were still struggling to establish their dominion in South India. The lecture discusses the most favoured form given to the god Shiva during these politically unstable times, his manifestation as victor of three forts. It also reviews the extraordinary manner in which patrons and donors placed inscriptions on every available space, on temple walls, base mouldings, and even grill windows. Good afternoon, friends. It was a brisk morning, but it's turned into a glorious afternoon. Must have been a difficult decision to come and sit in a darkened auditorium. But I appreciate it very much. Um, the title, of course, that you see there, The Thief Who Stole My Heart, Shiva. And today, we are going to stay in the first 100 years of Chola rule, 855 to 955. Will you step back with me in time to the year 875, early in the reign of the second Chola monarch, Aditya? And we're going to meet Lady Kadamba at a newly built stone temple along the Kaveri River. Standing in arrogant splendor, Lady Kadamba acknowledges the respectful greetings of the chief priest and his minions. Her husband, military general Vicky Annan, had led the armies of Chola King Aditya in a victorious thrust against the interior region known as Kongu, and Kongu was now part of this new Chola kingdom. In gratitude for Vicky Annan's pivotal role in this victory, Aditya had decorated him with an unprecedented group of honors, a throne, a royal fly whisk, a palanquin, drums, bugles, elephants, a palace, and an honorific title. Lady Kadamba rejoiced in this enhanced status that she had acquired, and she had announced her decision to make a gift to the temple in her husband's honor. And she is at the temple today in order to reward the stone carver who has engraved her commemorative gift into the temple wall in clear Tamil letters. Her cup is indeed running over. So our time together will, today will be spent in the delta of the Kaveri River during the first hundred years of Chola rule when its first three kings were in power. The founder of the dynasty was an upstart chieftain named Vijayalia, 
probably a feudatory of the Pallava rulers that you see on this map to the north. He took the ancient hallowed name of Chola and he established himself in the town of Tanjavur around the year 855. He wielded little power. His successor, Aditya Chola, the one who honored his general in the inscription we just looked at, threw off Pallava overlordship and assumed the title King Lion who captured the Pallavas. Royal copperplate charters of later Chola monarchs glorify the first two rulers of the dynasty. One charter speaks of the ease of Lejealia's capture of Tanjavur, and I quote, which he took as he would take by the hand his own wife. Another charter praises Aditya for having built a row of stone temples on both banks of the river Kaveri from the mountains down to the ocean. Royal charters are tricky things. They must be treated with caution. And this claim of later Chola monarchs surely contains a degree of hyperbole in its desire to claim a distinguished start for the dynasty. Aditya may not have built dozens of temples along the Kaveri River, but I cannot agree with recent propositions to the effect that Aditya may not have built a single temple. This, I will show, flies in the face of facts that I have unearthed. The third Chola ruler, Aditya's son, Parantaka, ascended the throne in 905. And it's possible that some of you have looked closely at the dates, in which case I need to tell you that the Chola custom was for father and son to rule jointly for a couple of years, and that's why the reign dates overlap. Parantaka's lengthy reign of 50 years was filled with repeated battles to the south with the Pandyas and the rulers of Sri Lanka, and more importantly to the north with the powerful Rashtrakutas who dealt Parantaka a crushing blow in the year 949. They killed on the battlefield his favorite son, his crown prince and, and chosen successor. So it is this 100-year period between 855 and 955, packed with repeated battles against kingdoms to both north and south, that witnessed the appearance for the very first time in bronze of memorable portable images of Shiva. Especially popular was Shiva's triumphant form as victor of three forts. There's nothing tentative about these first processional bronzes. Despite the political instability of a struggling and nascent Chola kingdom, skilled artists working in wax modeling workshops attached to metal foundries produced stately bronzes of rare elegance. They convey an assured sense of artistic maturity. Certain moments in time generate unprecedented originality and creativity. And the early Chola period is one such rare moment. Technology, trade contacts, agricultural prosperity, the socioeconomic milieu, united with religious intensity and artistic intentionality to create superb works of sacred art. In the Chola country, God Shiva became the intense focus of unquestioning devotion for all who contributed towards the enrichment of the temples, the chieftains, the princes, princesses, queens, military officers, merchants, and a diverse range of women too. The statistics are revealing. Of the 311 temples in the extended Kaveri Delta, and I'm not taking the entire empire, only its center, 209 temples honor God Shiva only 16 are dedicated to God Vishnu. The intensity of the focus on Shiva appears to have been conducive to the creation of finer and finer bronzes of a relatively restricted group of manifestations of Shiva. We saw last week that all Chola bronzes are portable images of deities created for use in temple processions that include rituals of daily, weekly, monthly occurrence, as well as three grand commemorations that extend over several days. 
and occur only once a year. Bronzes range considerably in size. Those that participate in daily rituals, such as this Shiva and Uma, who would have been carried in mini palanquins, hoisted onto the shoulders of the priests themselves, so that God and Goddess may inspect the temple premises every night. Such bronzes are small. They tend to measure 18 inches or so in height. Other bronzes that are featured in major annual festival processions, like this marriage group, reach over four feet tall. And bronze images are specific in usage to particular festivals, tailor-made for them, so to say. And this means that each temple must necessarily possess an entire series of portable bronzes. We saw, too, that the direct lost wax technique by which the bronzes are produced rules out the possibility of copies. The master artist's original image is created of wax, as you see here. You then have to create a baked clay mold. And when that is done, the original wax melts. Melts away, it's gone. And then finally, to release the metal image, that clay mold has to be smashed to smithereens. If an image is greatly admired and requested by another patron, the artist must create it again from scratch, modeling it in wax, covering it with clay, breaking the mold open uh, to release the, the metal image. And all Chola bronzes are heavy, solid bronzes that require large quantities of copper. Our conversation today will focus on three major issues. We'll start by identifying some of the earliest temples built during the reign of Aditya. You see them on the map to the upper left. We'll then turn to a consideration of, this, of the inscriptions, an incredible mantle of inscriptions that cover the outer walls of Chola temples. We will probe into the purpose of these epigraphs and explore the manner of their addition to the temple walls, base moldings, and so on. And then finally, for the rest of our time together, we'll focus on bronzes, primarily of Shiva as victor of three forts, a manifestation that had special appeal for kings battling for empire. Woven into our discussion of these bronzes will be the possibility of distinguishing between a coastal workshop and a capital interior workshop, a distinction I'm suggesting that is based largely on the proportional system used and on a few stylistic traits. So let me introduce you to this early group of seven temples. Largely ignored and uninvestigated, they are located in close proximity to the newly established Chola capital of Tanjavu. Until the moment that I started studying them, no one had looked seriously at these temples. And I believe they reveal the involvement of Aditya Chola, the second ruler. Why are we looking at temples when the bronzes are the prime focus? Well, because without the temples that serve as home to the bronzes, without the devotees who participate in temple processions of these bronzes, without the priests who enable these temple festivals, there would be no bronze portable images. So this cluster of seven small, well-proportioned temples stands along the banks of the Kaveri River within a range of merely four to eight miles northeast and northwest of Tanjavu, the newly established capital. They are located at the junction of two routes, one east-west along the Kaveri River, which is marked in blue, and the other running north and south from the capital of Tanjavu. The northernmost of these seven temples is Ayaru, right up there. Ayaru means five rivers, the Kaveri and four of its tributaries. This temple cluster is celebrated to this day as a group known as the Sacred Seven, in which the Ayaru temple's bronze portable image of Shiva with Uma is carried in procession over a series of days to each one of the other six temples. 
Inscriptions in two of these temples indicate that this custom dates back a thousand years. None of the seven carries a foundation inscription to tell us who is responsible for its construction. The sacred seven were ancient hallowed sites celebrated in the songs of the Shiva saints who composed their hymns between 650 and 850. And they sang of simple shrines, mostly of wood, thatch, occasionally brick. The repute of this septet is seen from the fact that the saints devoted several hymns to these sites, with as many as 18 hymns to Ayaru. In a verse on Ayaru, child saint Samandar, whom we encountered last week, sets aside stock poetic phrases to describe the beauty of the site. His words suggest instead first-hand viewing of an everyday mundane occurrence. The temple of the Lord is Ayaru, where the young buffalo runs scared by a coconut falling from a shady young palm and blunders into a bed of water lilies, scattering the ripe grain in a paddy field. Realistic and quite charming. Sometime in the latter half of the ninth century, the earlier thatch wood, perhaps brick temples at these seven sites were converted into the stone structures we see today small temples of the single story order. Perhaps this very fact, their conversion from brick to stone, explains why none has a foundation inscription. I mean, I mean, how do you claim the construction of a temple when one already existed at the site, perhaps in perishable material? The inscriptions that cover their walls carry anywhere from 50 to 101 inscriptions, and all record donations to already functioning temples. A scrutiny of these inscriptions reveals the close involvement of the Chola royal family with the maintenance and administration of the temples. Three records pertain to Aditya Chola, who ruled from 871 to 908. And this Natanam temple carries on its south wall the inscription with which we started today, in which Aditya Chola bestowed a range of extraordinary donors on Army General Vikyanan. And we saw that it was the honorary's wife, Lady Kadamba, who had the commemorative record engraved. A second inscription on this same wall indicates that in the year 878, Aditya's son, Kanaradeva, he died early, he never ascended the throne, but he made a gift of gold for a perpetually burning lamp to the temple, confirming, obviously, that the temple, the stone temple at Netanam, was in place before 878. We have a third related inscription, this time not from this temple itself, but from the adjoining temple of Ayaru. It informs us that a lady who was foster mother to Prince Kanaradeva, gifted gold for a perpetually burning lamp. In the year 891. While there are no dedicatory inscriptions here, these three records are strong pointers to the temple having been built by, or certainly with the blessings of, Aditya Chola. It's also significant that the nearby market town is named Adityapuram. Puram means town, so it's a town of Aditya. The town is mentioned in two inscriptions at these temples. Both record gifts of lamp. One came from the trading community of Adityapuram, and the second from a merchant belonging to a major trading guild that was headquartered in Adityapuram. Inscriptions in temples of the Sacred Seven reveal the continuing participation of three Chola princes, sons of Aditya's successor, Parantaka Chola. All three gave gifts to support the shrine. At Netanam, far left, one junior prince in the year 930 gave gold to be used for a perpetual lamp and for Ghi to keep the lamp burning. A second son of Parantaka, Uttamashili, 
on the right, who died early, gave a gift of gold and land for a perpetually burning lamp at this second temple of the seven. And a third prince, who ruled jointly with his father, similarly gifted gold for a lamp to a third temple of this sacred seven, also ghee to keep the lamps burning. These gifts to three temples of the septet from three royal princes during the reign of their father, Parantaka, suggest to me a royal relationship with a group of family temples. A further pointer to this is that Parantaka's own foster mother also made a gift to one of these temples in the year 919, and by then, Parantaka was no little child. He had been on the throne for 13 years. So I propose that this cluster of seven temples, the sacred seven, Sapta Stala they are referred to, was rebuilt in stone during the reign of Aditya towards the end of the third quarter of the ninth century. And they continued to serve as a focal point for the royal family for a considerable time thereafter. You may have noticed that gifts, royal or otherwise, are for perpetually burning lamps. Gifts of lamps may sound like a petty matter, but they were not so. In fact, inscriptions suggest that this is one of the burning issues in the Chola period. Apologies for that, it was unintentional. <laughs> and that lamps to illuminate the way within temples was a huge priority. At Netanam, over half of the 63 inscriptions are gifts to ensure adequate illumination. The interior of temples are always dark, need illumination day and night. Perpetually burning lamps that stayed alight night and day required a major infusion of funds to ensure a steady supply of ghee to keep the wicks burning. In general, whichever temple we look at, we find that just about half the records are always for these perpetual lamps. Donors sometimes gave gold or land for these lamps, but even more frequently, they made gifts of goats, usually 90 in number. These were entrusted to specific shepherds who then undertook to supply ghee daily to keep temple lamps burning. And lamp donors came from all levels of society. We have a clothes washerman, Dobi type, at one end of the economic strata. He must have stretched his financial resources to the extreme. And we also have the chieftains of Tanjawu and Kotu and other cities. Let's turn our focus now to the extraordinary manner in which the walls of early Chola temples are totally covered with inscriptions. They flow seamlessly around niches that carry sculpted figures across the light projections and recesses of the temple walls, as you can see on this area. Um, they are inscribed along base moldings, and they are even inscribed along trellis windows. And try to ignore the modern crude cement repair work that you see here. This massive archive contains fascinating information that I will use throughout our meetings to discuss the temples, their bronzes, and their ritual worship. It's curious, I find it curious, that scholarship on India has bemoaned India's lack of a sense of history, complaining that there were no chroniclers who kept track of events, and that it was only with the coming of Islam to India that historical archives came into existence. Certainly it's true that as far as India's artistic heritage is concerned, we have no equivalent of, say, Vincent of Beauvais, who wrote enthusiastically about his Beauvais Cathedral. And regrettably, there's no Vasari to leave us details about artists and their works. But what, in fact, do we mean by a sense of history? In Tamil Nadu, starting around the year 850, when the Cholas appeared on the scene, inscriptions of local import, historical, judicial, and otherwise, began to appear in large numbers in the walls of every temple in the Kaveri Delta. 
There are 10,000 such inscriptions on temple walls, of which only 1,000 are available in English translation. Another 2,000 are accessible only in the form of the briefest of brief synopsis in, in English, two lines, sometimes three, uh, in a set of volumes that was published in the 1990s. The remaining 7,000 inscriptions, two-thirds of our material for the Chola period, have never been published. They've never been printed. They are available to scholars and researchers only as unwieldy original rubbings taken from the temple walls, or sometimes as handwritten copies of these rubbings. And these are in the offices of the Epigraphical Survey of India, where I spent several days working with this material, together with a colleague whose specialty is Tamil epigraphy. We unrolled such rubbings across the floor of an open corridor and tried very hard not to transfer suit patches from our fingers onto our face and clothes. The inscriptions are in the original Tamil of the 9th to 13th centuries, and that differs from modern Tamil about as much as Chaucerian English differs from modern English. Temples in our focal area for these six lectures, the Kaveri River Basin, account for over 5,000 half the inscriptions, and they generally record gifts to already functioning temples. An interesting thing that the inscriptions reveal is that temples constructed early in the Chola period continued to receive active patronage throughout the four and more centuries, four and a quarter centuries of Chola rule. As we explore their content, we find ourselves confronted with a treasure trove of material that sheds light on every aspect of the times. Sociopolitical circumstances through the economics of agriculture, irrigation, and trade, to the religious milieu within which the temples functioned, never mind the patronage of the arts. We learn of the wide range of individuals residing in different towns in the vicinity who were involved in supporting sacred rituals within the temples. They made gifts of bronzes of deities, they gave jewels to adorn the bronzes, they donated land or cash for lighting permanent lamps in the temple, for the provision of sacred food in the temple, to provide perfume, camphor, and flower garlands for the bronzes. The list is seemingly endless. And in the midst of such details, we hear of a number of fascinating semi-judicial issues I'll give you only two. One such concerns the misbehavior of two temple priests at the Shivapuram temple, more or less in the coastal belt. Their list of misdemeanors commences with taking a pearl necklace of the goddess Uma and giving it to a concubine. The inscription further accuses them of keeping false accounts, of stealing rice, of defying royal orders. The inscription tells us that the temple authorities met with the town council, and they pronounced the two priests guilty of a crime both against God Shiva and against the king. So they were sentenced to be excommunicated, and their property, both movable and immovable, these are Tamil judicial terms, was to be handed over to the state. Another temple inscription gives expression to the principle that we today speak of as eminent domain. This enables a city or a state to take over privately owned property for certain necessary purposes, common interest purposes. So this in the inscription records an agreement made in the year 1207 that had the sanction of the Chola king. It was agreed that the street in front of the temple was not wide enough to accommodate the grand processions of bronze deities that were now being conducted by the temple. The authorities had been authorized to demolish the houses on one side of the street fronting the temple. And the inscription tells us that they were now required to make adequate repairs and alterations to the alternate housing that had been provided for those dispossessed house owners. 
A sustained study of all the inscriptions engraved on a single temple is illuminating. And to do that, I take you to the Nageshwara temple in the extended coastal belt, a temple constructed soon after 905 when Parantaka came to the throne. The temple's 54 inscriptions were added to its walls over a period of roughly 125 years. First, maybe a quick introduction to the stone sculptures on the walls of the temples, especially the two female figures on the south wall that are blocked in this view by an ugly modern construction. The dignity and bearing of these two women suggests aristocracy or royalty, while the assured treatment of the figures speaks of the hands of accomplished stone carvers. Equally, one might look at the rear wall of the shrine that carries portraits of two male aristocrats, portraits perhaps in quotes. This moustached figure has the same poise and confidence of a courtly figure, probably carved by the same talented sculptor, certainly the same workshop. So will you step back once more in time and join me at the Nageshwara temple in the year 934 to meet with a veteran engraver of inscriptions. Holding his favorite chisel in one hand and a single palm leaf document in the other, the expert engraver walks around the Nageshwara temple. He knows that the keeper of the records has chosen him for this job because he's one of those rare carvers who knows both Sanskrit and Tamil and can write in two different scripts with ease. The donor of a major gift of gold to the temple, he was the headman of the town of Karuvur nearby, wanted his donation to be recorded in both languages in both scripts. And for this bilingual commission, a complicated one, the carver sort of smiles with pleasure. He's willing to pay high fees to a specialist like him. The temple has only recently been completed and most of its surfaces are available for inscription. The carver decides that he's going to engrave the record against this rear face of the temple, along the temple's base moldings, the green lines that I've placed here. Its placement, he decides, will force the arrogant donor who had the gall to title himself Lord of Gifts to bend down to admire his record. <laughs> to examine the apparently random placement of stone inscriptions on walls that as yet had nothing inscribed on them, we'll turn to the south face of the Nageshwara temple. I've used green to mark the earliest inscriptions those of the reign of Parantaka Chola, and so between 905 and 955. They're not royal inscriptions, they're just inscriptions that are dated in the monarch's reign. As you see here, one inscription runs almost the entire length of the base moldings all the way, while the other two are placed on the walls. So, both Tamil and Sanskrit scripts run from left to right in the same manner as English. So a viewer who would walk around the temple in the ritually appropriate clockwise manner, which is circumambulation or pradakshina, such a viewer would encounter the end of a line of inscription, where it ends somewhere here and starts all the way at the other end. In other words, reading inscriptions and the right of worship did not go hand in hand. Temple inscriptions were archival in purpose. They recorded gifts to the temple. They had no direct religious function in that way. It's doubtful too whether literacy was at a level where visitors to a temple could read these inscribed records. Perhaps, most probably, they were read by none other than the donors themselves, the priests, and let's not forget the adjudicators of disputes on the use of the recorded gifts of land, gold, and the like. The next cluster of inscriptions, and I've marked them here in blue, 
belonged to three monarchs who ruled in the 30 years that intervened between the death of Parantaka and the accession of the great emperor Raja Raja. In other words, between 955 and 985. These inscriptions are largely on the temple walls where they run across pilasters, as you might note, a, a, a light pilaster here. Um, but as you can see, there is also one along the upper base, uh, level of the base moldings. By 985, when Raja Raja became king, space for inscriptions was running out. The record marked in red dates to the year 1015. It belongs to a woman donor who made a generous gift to the temple so that her darling lord, Challa Piran, that's the word, her darling lord would be honored every day with a garland of red lotuses and a noonday meal. And those meals were always distributed then to temple employees and devotees. Despite the shortage of available space, she managed to have the record engraved on this south face of the temple. The engraver was enterprising. He commenced his inscription, as you see, across the entire available space above the sculpted image. He then encounters an inscription in blue and moves across to the remaining space on the right. Once there, he sees that there is an even earlier inscription. So where is he going to finish this? Along the pilaster to the right in its narrow vertical space. Why use temple walls as the public records office? The words of the inscription, the wording, indicates that the records were also written on palm leaf manuscripts. But palm leaf has clearly not survived the hot and humid climate of Tamil Nadu. And then there are so many judicial judgments since they would require revisiting as and when disputes arose regarding the many gifts to a temple. It would appear that inscribed stone constituted a highly reliable record keeping system. It was also right there out in the open for all parties to consult. And so to bronzes of Shiva as victor of three forts, a manifestation that seems to have held special significance during the first century and a half of Chola rule, when war was a constant and recurring fact of life. While the third Chola monarch Parantaka ruled for all of 50 years, those were not peaceful years. And the loss of his eldest son and crown prince, who was slain in action on the battlefield, makes it clear that Chola control over a vulnerable kingdom centered in the Kaveri River Delta was still a work very much in progress. During this perilous period, Shiva's warrior-like manifestation as victor of three forts, holding a bow in upraised left hand and arrow in his lowered right hand, proved to be an inspiration for Chola royalty and also for the families of chieftains and officials who made gifts to the temples. By the way, the bow and arrow were always cast separately and are generally missing today. According to myth, Shiva once took this warlike form in order to destroy the fortified cities of three lethal demonic enemies who threatened the stability of the universe. And what did Shiva do? He used one single arrow to penetrate the, and destroy all three forts. The large-scale commissioning of images of victorious Shiva appear motivated by the Chola desire for an exemplary deity, a deity who would serve as their archetypal model for victorious warfare and for the defeat of their enemies. It could be coincidence, but it's interesting to note that in the early 10th century, the Cholas too were fighting three major sets of enemies, the Pandyas and the rulers of Lanka to the south and the Rashtrakutas to the north. During this first 100 years, 
Bronzes of Shiva as victor of three forts outnumber surviving images of other forms of Shiva and appear to have been commissioned in temple after temple. Yes, while keeping in mind the vagary of survival, it's relevant to turn to an inscription of the year 925 of Paranthaka's chief queen, Kokilan, mother of that crown prince. She dedicated the image described in the inscription as handsome one of the three worlds. In case there should be any doubt about the form that the image took, she further specified that the image was a metal image, a processional image, and it was an image of the Lord who burnt three forts. Ironically, tragically, her son, the crown prince, was to be slain on the battlefield. With this royal commission as an inscriptional placeholder, we'll turn to look at bronzes of Victor of the Three Forts. In the course of examining such images, I would like to explore with you a related aspect, a stylistic aspect of these early bronzes. As I revisited temples in the Kaveri Delta during the past couple of years to look at bronzes, as I rechecked museum collections around the world, I found that during the first century of Cholaru, it appears possible to distinguish between the hands of two workshops, located maybe no more than 50 miles apart. I really got drawn into this material that has not been studied before in this manner. You can decide whether or not you agree with me. What I'm calling the coastal workshop, and you see examples on the screen now, existed in the vicinity of the port town, the major Chola port of Nagapaknam, and it produced images for a number of temples in the area. Coastal images are exceedingly slender and sinuous, with a proportion of an elongated torso to lower limbs that makes them seem very tall, and their faces tend to be perfect ovals. The capital workshop operated in and around the Chola capital of Tanjavur, and extended inland way beyond Trichy. These images display a different proportionality with a shorter torso. Broader shoulders make them seem more solidly grounded, a square touch is given to their faces. And as you can see by what I have on the screen, I pr propose such distinctions for both bronzes and for stone sculptures of this first hundred years. Some of the earliest bronzes of Shiva come from temples in the coastal belt. And here you can see the, the uh, port town of Nagapatnam. The ports, there are four of them, were clearly of crucial importance to the early Chola monarchs. The Shiva temple at the southernmost port of Mare Kadu, I'm sorry, it seems to have got a little bit cut off here, um, has, uh, carries a set of 38 inscriptions belonging to the reign of Parantaka. And they tell us that Parantaka conducted several campaigns to Sri Lanka from this port. If you notice this um, coloration in grayish white, um, until recent peace in Sri Lanka, these swampy marshes was the illicit entry point for those involved with the Tamil Liberation Army. And to this day, the port and that area is completely out of bounds. This image of Shiva and Uma as bridegroom and bride is one we looked at briefly last week when I proposed that the bronze duo represents the birth, the very initiation of the phenomenon of Chola processional bronzes. Prior to this, portable festival images were made of wood. So it's relevant here to look more closely at this duo. Standing 27 and 20 inches above their common pedestal, the duo was probably created soon after the year 855 for a temple in this coastal belt. Barakalatu, I won't repeat it again. <laughs> a, a diadem, a standard and favorite adornment of the Chola period, um, frames Shiva's and Uma's faces. 
there's a decorative clasp topped with a rounded ornament that holds back Shiva's matted locks that are arranged in towering splendor with each set of dreadlocks ending in a sort of ringlet-like curve. The crescent moon adorns his locks on one side, the trumpet flower stands upright on the other, while a fully open lotus blossom crowns at the very top. Shiva wears a single large earring in his left ear, and his friendly serpent looks over his right shoulder. The lowest of his three necklaces is arranged to rest on his chest in a soft V formation. And this V shape is echoed further down by the triangular flap of his short dhoti, which is wrapped around his hips and held in place by a decorative belt with simple fabric loops at each end. A Brahmanical sacred thread, a high waistband to encircle his torso, armlets, elbow band, bangles, anklets, rings on eight toes, eight of 10 toes and 16 of 24 fingers, of 20 fingers. Uma is likewise richly adorned. If we turn now to look at a superb bronze of seated Shiva, two feet high, from a temple in the same coastal belt, one is struck by the many resemblances to the divine bridegroom that we have just examined. These include the manner in which the matted locks are piled high, the diadem, the elaborate clasp, the circular medallion is here converted into a skull. Ring in one ear, dangling earring in the other. Lowest of three necklaces resting softly on his chest in that same V formation. There is the same high waistband and similarly draped sacred thread as also that simple belt with those soft fabric loops at either end to hold his dhoti in place. The snake peeping over his right shoulder is broken but is visible in rear view. And we also encounter that undefinable beauty of the exquisite oval face with a hint of the smile that the artist has succeeded in capturing. The main difference is that the body of Shiva has moved away from the drastically flattened form reminiscent of bar relief sculpture that we spoke about last week as characterizing that first marriage duo, almost as if the images had been sliced away from a bar relief. Shiva's body has now acquired a degree of three-dimensionality that is so very possible with wax modeling. And this change appears to have occurred in a period of about 25 years. This standing victor of three forts from the same coastal temple, 30 inches high, reveals a similar stylistic idiom, though it comes from the hand of a second sculptor. While there is much to comment on here, I will draw your attention only to the puzzling fact that the bronze casters did not file away the metal rod that joins Shiva's left shoulder to the prancing antelope that he holds in his rear left hand. That is a necessary part of the bronze casting process, but such rods were always filed away in the finishing stages. Here, it appears that the artist might have felt that the almost horizontal leap of the little pet antelope could do with additional support, and he seems to have refrained from removing it. Another image of Shiva as victor of three forts, 24 inches high, also belongs to the coastal style and is closer to the marriage duo in the somewhat flattened handling of the body. At the same time, the artist has rounded out the buttocks somewhat as his experience grew with freeform wax modeling that does so encourage this three-dimensionality. While several details are familiar from the Divine Bridegroom and the two Shivas of the Coastal Temple that we just looked at, note the U formation of the lower of his two necklaces and the unusual simplicity of his armlets that are mere bands of fabric tied into a simple knot on the rear of his arm. The apparently effortless splendor of the image almost disguises its mastery. We move slightly inland, 
but still within the coastal workshop zone to examine a captivating Shiva of three forts. I will refer to its wax modeler as the master of the off-kilter substyle. <laughs> Stunning poised with one hand, as usual, raised to hold the bow, this Shiva, 30 and a half inches tall, appears almost off balance. And yet this solid metal image weighing an estimated 90 pounds is totally stable. Exceedingly slender, standing on his right leg with his right hip thrust outwards, and with his body in exaggerated contraposto of the type we have not yet encountered today, this two-armed Shiva is totally comfortable with his seemingly precarious posture. High matted locks display the usual trumpet flower, crescent moon, medallion above his diadem, large earring in one ear, serpent over his right shoulder. And note two features that are similar to the image we just examined. The lower of his two necklaces is treated in an elongated U shape, and his armlets are those simple fabric bands tied at the rear. The enchantment of this image is enhanced, to, to my mind, by what seems an unbalanced stance. But in fact, it reflects the artist's comfort level with the wax model, he, the wax image that he has modeled, and his confidence that the resulting bronze would be totally stable. He pushed the limits of the stance, of that there is no doubt, but he knew his materials sufficiently, both wax and metal, to be sure he was on safe ground. In the context of donors and bronzes commissioned from master artists, we should point out that wax modelers were attached to workshops that had a foundry equipped with a range of mud ovens in which the clay-covered wax images were baked, and fire pits in which metal was melted in order to pour, pour into these hollow clay molds. Master modelers rarely moved from one foundry to another. Rather, it was the patrons who moved around to commission images from one or other foundry renowned for its wax modeler. This continues to be the case to this day. Temple priests bring donors to the famous bronze workshops at a town called Swami Malay, which happens to be in the coastal belt. When the commission is ready, the priests and donors return to the workshop to collect it. They perform the first ritual sanctification of the image in the bronze workshop itself, and only then take the bronze back to their own temple, which might easily be 50 to 100 miles away or more. And do note that the hammer and chisels placed in front of those lemons are part of this ritual. The many early bronzes from the coastal belt, the few that we examine today are marked by large yellow stars within the purple zone. These bronzes speak both to the sanctity of the sites of that area as well as to the strategic importance of ports during Chola rule. Tanjavur, and you can in fact just see it there, the capital of Tanjavur, um, it served as the Chola administrative and military center, but it was a newly settled town and it did not have a sacred shrine at its heart. In fact, a Shiva temple was built there only around the year 1000. Prior to that date, the temples of the Sacred Seven, the cluster of smaller yellow stars, are representative of the style at the capital. We move inland, the blue zone, to consider an image of Shiva as victor of three forts, standing three feet high from a temple that is roughly 25 miles west of the Chola capital of Tanjavur. The image represents work of the very same period that we have been examining in the coastal workshops. But this one comes from the hand of an artist with a slightly different, though equally assured style that I'm terming the capital style. Shiva's face is more a broad U-shape rather than the ovals we encountered along the coast. 
the width of the shoulders and the straightness of the shoulders, the lack of a sharp slope, is more marked. The iconography and adornment is largely familiar. Curiously, the standard high waistband that normally adorns the male torso is absent in this bronze. And here, its absence seems to result in a somewhat awkward and unwieldy treatment of that waist area contrapposto that is so smoothly handled in the other instances. This artist made a small variation on images of Victor of the Three Forts that we have looked at thus far, and he introduced a crouching dwarf-like figure upon whose back Shiva rests his left foot. It represents Mushalagan, an egotistic demon who must be controlled. This little figure holding a serpent in one hand is portrayed here as a non-threatening creature whom Shiva has well under control. Note the positioning of the god to stand at an oblique angle to his rectangular pedestal. There are two damaged stumps placed obliquely on the rectangular pedestal, aligned to match the angle at which Shiva stands. These once held the flame-tipped aureole that would have enclosed all bronzes, framing them, thereby emphasizing their sacred significance. This late 13th century image with its aureole intact gives you an idea of that framing aureole, which is generally missing in most of our bronzes. You can see on the left one broken stump. The second broken stump is hidden in this view by the head of the little dwarf demon. The attention paid to aligning that aureole not, a, not just straight across, but to appropriately frame Shiva's angled pose, reveals the priorities of an artist to whom such niceties mattered. You may have noticed and wondered about certain dissimilarities among the images we have examined. The first is the blurring of details on the two coastal bronzes we looked at. To the left, and now to the right. These two images have remained in worship since their creation some 1100 years ago. They have been lustrated with milk and yogurt and honey and saddle paste and water, and the priest's right hand would move from crown to foot in the manner typical of a right-handed motion. There is also ritual cleansing after the images have been taken in procession beyond the temple grounds. Upon their return to temple premises, they are rubbed down with the olive of the palm tree that brings the sheen back to copper and indeed also to silks and gold thread. And by the way, this olive of the palm tree, it suds up when you put it in water, gave its name to the brand name Koge Palm Olive. <laughs> Years of ritual worship, Purificatory renewal for further worship have smoothed, rounded, blurred the profile of the nose, the eyes, the lips, the diadem, several other original details. By contrast, the bronze we have been just examining, now more towards the left, was recovered only recently from its underground burial spot. Its details are crisper and sharper, matching more closely the original vision of its artist. The second difference, and let's look at them again, is the variation in the color of the images. The ones from the coastal temple to the left and now again to the right are dark in color, while the one between is greenish in hue. The dark images have stood in the temple since their creation over a thousand years ago and exposed to air, thereby acquiring this dark hue. By contrast, the greenish hue is a patina acquired by copper when it is exposed to humid conditions or buried in moist soil. The image with the green patina was buried in the year 1310, some 400 years after it was created. 
an issue that I will bypass today and leave as a mystery to unravel in our final session together. During this early period of 100 years, between 855 and 955, a close stylistic relationship is seen between the work of stone carvers and that of wax modelers. A comparison of the stone queen from the Nageshwara temple on the right with the dated bronze of Uma 917, year 917, from a coastal temple is instructive. There is a close similarity in the treatment of their elongated proportional system, the sloping shoulders, their light swaying bodies, and faces that are tapered ovals. By contrast, this bronze Uma appears to be from the capital belt. Broader face, wider shoulders, more compact proportion of torso to lower limbs seems to be characteristic of the inland capital area. And here I place her side by side with both a front and a rear view of the coastal Uma of the year 917. I'm suggesting that it is the proportional system used by the wax modeler, shorter torso, less extended lower limbs, that makes the Uma to the left from the Metropolitan, makes her body more compact and less sinuous than the coastal browns. Her full-bodied figure contrasts with the considerably more supple, slender, light coastal browns. While this is an issue that needs further exploration, I suggest that the distinction may be the result of using a slightly variant proportional system. And the texts with proportional systems are about to be written shortly by the year 1000 or thereabouts, right in this period. Using the face as the measure, and all texts do that, the coastal proportion on the right seems to be one face to two torsos, the capital area seems to be one face to one and a half torsos, does create a slightly different aesthetic effect. This central capital style Uma from the Met bears close similarity to the figure of Shiva as half woman from one of the temples of our sacred seven near Tanjawu that we considered earlier, one that represents the capital style. A great number of similarities in the two. The untidy arrangement of pleats along the left thigh of both images is striking. But unfortunately, I have to tell you that it's a characteristic of many 10th century images, regardless of whether they belong to the coastal or to the central style. A pity. A final useful exercise would be to compare and contrast two stone images. Shiva is half woman on the left from the capital workshop, one of the sacred seven that we looked at, and on the right from the coastal workshop. Both belong to the early 900s, but the capital workshop gives its image a U-shaped face, broader shoulders, a less sinuous outline, all of which contrast with the image from the coastal workshop on the right. We've seen today that the constant battles fought by Chola kings Aditya and Parantaka did little to inhibit the creativity of their stone sculptors and wax modelers who created outstanding images in maybe two lightly varying stylistic modes. It does appear, however, that warfare influenced the choice of imagery in that Shiva's warring form as victor of three forts became a favored god, serving as an exemplary model at a time when bloody battles were the order of the day. This popularity of Shiva as victor of three forts continued into the reign of the great emperor Raja Raja, who some 40 years later captured all of South India, the Maldive Islands, and most of Sri Lanka, all the lavender shaded areas making the name, of course, Chola a force to be reckoned with. When he built his great temple at the capital of Tanjavur, he decided that every one of the stone images on the upper level of his temple walls 
you're seeing one side. There are 32 such images. All of them would portray the figure of Shiva as victor of three forts. Rajaraja's command of an expanded Chola empire was assured by the time he built the temple. The repeated emphasis on this manifestation appears to be a celebration of the grace that is bestowed upon him by Shiva, a thanksgiving for victorious Shiva's blessings that enabled him to capture such vast territories. This all-powerful Shiva, who defeats threatening forces of evil, who maintains the stability of the world, who is ascetic of ascetics, is also the thief who steals your heart. He is the beautiful God whom devotees will follow to the ends of the earth. Thank you. <laughs>